every person wants to be more productive. But the key to productivity is not just being more organized, scheduling, prioritizing, deadlines. It's about laying out a plan that begins with a vision and ends with a final product that's aligned with that vision and all the steps in between. When you learn this system, it not only teaches you how to be more productive, but also helps you actualize your deepest potential. These four steps will help you become a far better and greater person. So anything in this world that you want to build, that you want to produce, requires steps. And if you don't do those steps correctly, at some point it will give or it will be compromised. So there's a fascinating model, Kabbalistic model. It's called the four worlds. But the word worlds is a little uh, misleading. It's not four planets. It's not four universes. It's four dimensions. I would call them four steps. Four steps used in the creation process that we can emulate and we need to emulate to be the best we can be. What are the four steps? The first is vision. You must begin with a vision. Then followed by an outline. In turn, followed by a shape and form as you structure it. And the fourth step is to finalize the full dimensional in all its details and nuances and you have a final product. It's finished. We will begin with the first step, which of course is the step that leads everything leads into everything else. It's called vision. The Hebrew word for it in the Kabbalistic model is called atzilus. It's a word that literally means emanation, but it also is associated with unity, with a bird's eye view. Vision is an excellent word that captures what it's all about. Anything worth talking about always has to begin with some vision. In business, they may call it a vision statement, followed by a mission statement. That vision is what will define and inform every step of the way. If you're lacking vision in anything, the product will never be a complete one and definitely will be compromised one way or another. And vision doesn't necessarily mean right now a spiritual vision and a deepest vision on a cosmic level. I'm talking about on a very basic level. Someone wants to build a home. So you sit down with an architect. The architect says, what would you like in your home? He says, well, I'd like 10 bedrooms. I'd like a beautiful living room. I'd like a dining room. I'd like a sitting room, children playroom, a nice porch, all depending obviously on the square feet and, and so on. But the architect, a good architect, will say to you, but what? that's the details of the structure. But why do you want to have this home? Is this a country home? Is this a place you, your primary residence? Will you have parties? In other words, what did you want? What's the purpose of the home? Form follows function. What is the function? And this is true in any given situation. I counsel people about many different things, people in marriage, people who want to publish a book, or have different type, they want to start a business, or they have started and they're having challenges. The first question you want to ask is, what's your objective? What do you want to get across? Now, many of us, it sounds simple. Many of us, however, don't always articulate that clearly. You have it in your heart, in your gut, and you may feel strongly about it, but you don't yet have it spelled out. It's critical to spell it out literally in writing, even one sentence. What do you want the final result to accomplish. So for example, someone wants to write a book. They have a, 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 their family story. What they learned through their family story that we went through hardships and we became a greater, we became greater people, a greater family. So you, what you want to show is how difficulties in life should not cause you to feel resigned, give up, but to come away stronger. And you have a way to teach it through your story. That's a, that's a lie, that's a vision. A vision that will help other people. I just use a very simple example. You want to build a home. Before you talk about the details, what rooms, what, how many rooms, what, is, what do you want in this home? What do you want to capture in this home? So look and feel is following the soul of the home. So the first step of all is vision, laying out the vision. 
having the bird's eye view, the larger perspective. Now, obviously, you can't build a vision. The vision will inform the next steps. If you stay there, many of us are dreamers. There are many people who are visionaries, but they never go further than that. There's no execution. That will address afterwards. But a bigger problem can be if you have execution and you don't have vision. There are people who are excellent at implementing, and then you ask them, so what are you implementing? Oh, I'm not really sure. Or you say something, it's not even accurate. Imagine coming, you're seeing a building going up, and you ask the people, the, con the contractor and the different teams, so what are you building? They'll say, well, we're just following the instructions. They may not even know what they're building. So the key thing is to have, we'll call it the soul of the whole picture. When I say soul, I mean the inner work, the inner dimension. What's driving you? What's in your heart? People ask, what should I do with my life? The first question has to be asked when you, when is not what you, what you should do with your life. What do you want to do? What drives you? What would give you satisfaction? Someone say, I'd love to build a beautiful family. Okay, we have something. I love to express my musical talent. So all these are vision levels where you're talking about something that is not the tangible structure, but what drives it. And it's critical. When the vision is not in place, all the other steps will be limited. Let's talk about it in a more psychological context. Love. You know, people have love. Love is a necessity in life to give love, to receive love. But there's healthy love, there's unhealthy love. We see it all the time. We see relationships succeeding. We see failing relationships, unfortunately. If you were able to apply the vision principle that I just stated, here's how it would work. You have two people who care about each other, married, let's say, for a certain period of time, but now things are really rocky. They're not getting along. There's tension, there's challenges. And you say to them, okay, so tell, besides telling me the problems, which are the symptoms, let's get to the root of it all. Do what is your vision for marriage? What is the vision of your home? You'll often find that people will not have an answer to that. They never thought of it. I never thought of it, I hear so often. I love this man, I love this woman. We've come together. We'll build a home and family. What values do you want to convey to your children when you will have children? When people come into your home, what vibe do you want it to give off? Many of us do not think about it. Not because we're bad people, because we weren't trained to think about it. Why is that so vital? Because even love itself, love is an emotional experience, a powerful one. But at the same time, what is driving this love? The love can be driven by selfish needs. We learn from our parents' Love, which can be healthy, not healthy, something in between, the gray area. So even the word love, as powerful as it is, also needs direction. What does love mean? What is love meant to achieve? Now, if a person says, I feel my soul came to this world to accomplish and use my skills to make the world a better place. I know it sounds like a cliche. To spiritualize my environment to bring a little more gentleness and kindness and tenderness into a hostile world. That is a visionary statement. And I will do so through my unique skills. I'm a good people person. I'm gonna get involved in different social activities to, to, bring, to bring some more kindness, to bring more virtue, to bring to higher this, the spiritual consciousness or awareness of people. And if you can make a living from that, great, beautiful. It's driven by a vision. A vision and the vision is specific to you because it's about your particular skills how you're going to achieve it whenever people ask me so what is your vision what is your uh, mission so my vision is i'll stay straightforward my vision is to use well before i say to you let's talk about a vision means how i see the future based on what i'm contributing i'd like to see a world of complete world peace and harmony within diversity, respecting the diversity of all individuals, and people living up to their inner calling, all being part of an indispensable part of a large cosmic symphony. And therefore not distracted by other people, not having to please, but really something driven from within. Basically to sing your song. Every person sing their song. And how, how, how do I contribute to that? 
I tried to use my communication skills, my writing skills, my people skills to convey that message, to empower exactly what I'm doing right now. So there's a vision behind this course. The vision is, is to help people use this Kabbalistic model to become more fulfilled and living up to their higher calling in this world. So if you have not if you have that vision, and let's apply it now to love in a relationship, then your love is not driven just, okay, I love this person, I'm getting what I need, intimacy, companionship, a friend, all that other things love comes, the nurturing, the support, the confidence, the vote of confidence. But the vision is driven by, I'm sorry, the love is driven by a vision, by an atzillus. So love will go into the execution states, which we'll talk about, the, that came across with a little sounds weird execution. I meant execution as implementation. We'll come into a, a outline and then a shape and then a finalization, which we will discuss. But the first thing is the vision of that love. If the vision of that love is that you and I together, our, through our love, will bring more love into the world. We'll bring children who will be loving people. We'll in some way infuse existence and everyone we come in contact with with a kindness, with something unique, empowering people, then the love is driven by a vision and the love is directed and guided. So everything in life has to have that. If the love does not have a vision, what will happen is it'll just be relying on its own, its own devices. So one day, the love may lose, may lose vitality. It may be misguided because there's no vision driving it. And the same is true with everything. I mentioned before writing a book, building a structure, composing music, a business project, whether it's building a business or a particular project in the business. Lay out the vision at the, at the outset and you will have that direction. The second thing you'll have from it is not just direction, you'll also have a unifying principle because that's what vision is. What is a bird's eye view at the end of the day? It's not losing sight it's seeing the forest from the trees. Sometimes they use the expression seeing the trees from the forest, even though it sounds incorrect, but it's used as well. What does that mean? In other words, not getting caught up in the minutia and the details, which will be necessary when you get to that stage. But it's driven by, I see the picture. I see the panorama. I see the narrative. And now let me spell it out into details. So it's also a unifying factor. So when you get caught up in the details, you always have that, that uh, reality check coming from the vision aspect. And just to use it, explain it in an intellectual process. How often do we have an idea? You know, you have a flash of an idea. Then you begin to flush it out. Either with yourself, or you have a business, or you have a, if it's a business meeting, or it's a meeting or a brainstorm session, you bring up the idea. And people start arguing about it and the pros and cons, and this one says, here's a way to do it, here's another way. What often happens? There comes a point of confusion. You have so many different details, as you're fleshing it out, you can lose sight of the point of departure. And that happens very often. Then you say, what was our initial idea? If you didn't write it down, you may even forget it. So one of the tricks of the trade is, write down the initial idea before you begin to develop it. And it's a critical to develop it. Not suggesting that. We must have that stage where you bring it into all the details and then you will weed out the details that seem to be the right ones. Let's say you have three ways to implement this, this idea. So you lay it all out, the pros and cons, you argue it out, you stretch the idea in many different directions. So the first step is vital because that's where the point of departure is. Now, if you come to an ex a conclusion that the idea wasn't a good one, Okay, that's another story. But what you want is that the idea, the concept, meaning the vision of the concept, that spark, should always be there as the point of departure because the rest of it is the details of that. And the details can overwhelm and to the point of confusion. That's the second component in this atzillus, this vision step, which creates a unifying element that unify, unites all the details. That is, my friends, the beginning of developing the Atsilas, the visions, the step one. There are four personality types, archetypes, that define us all. Check out the description below, a course on the Kabbalah of the four elements. We will now address 
What's the next step? What's the step number two? So briefly, it's creating an outline, a structure. Vision alone is critical because it drives the whole engine and it's the soul of whatever it is that you're creating, whether it's a building, whether it's a piece of music, whether it's a book, whether it's a business plan, whether it's a strategy at home or at work or in any given area. But vision alone is still an abstract reality. We want it to become concrete. So can you just go ahead and jump to the next step and said, let's start building, let's start writing the book, let's start composing the music? No. If you want it to be done really effectively and in a healthy way, make sure it's going to be aligned and the final product will be and maintain the integrity and and express the integrity of the original vision, you need you cannot jump step number two, which is outline. In simple terms, if you're writing a paper, for instance. So after you say, here's the concept, here's my title, here's that one line vision, what do I want to convey? Now you make an outline. You don't begin fleshing it out yet. You begin making an outline. What's an outline? An outline consists of categories, subcategories, they don't have to be spelled out yet in detail. You're just creating organized outline, a skeleton. The reason this step is so critical because it's the bridge between vision and implementation. It's the first step. And by this outline, you're really creating the, the general infrastructure then which you will then, in step three, flesh out into details. So this is called in the Kabbalistic model, step two, Bria. Bria literally means creation. To use an example, let's say you want to mold a raw piece of clay into a, a, piece, a pot or another, another uh, vessel. So first you have the raw piece of clay. You have not yet shaped it yet, but you begin to create an outline in it, which then you will fine tune as you develop it further. Very many times I see when mistakes are made very often it's in step number two obviously the most obvious mistake is step number one when vision is not clear or not there in the first place and you begin building without having that vision but the second most uh, most common mistake is the outline is not well done which will then cause that when you start breaking into details you'll go and see one second maybe step a should, should be placed as step B. Think of it as a speaker who's going to speak. They may be conveying all the great, great ideas, but they're not organized, which means all everything that you need is said, but it's not structured properly. So it's confusing. You want to make sure, and I'm going to give an example, you want to make sure that your outline is really well structured. So if you're going to build a house, I'm not talking about the physical structure right now. We're talking about the blueprint. So you want to know where the living room is, where the dining room is, where's the kitchen, where are the bedrooms, where are the playrooms, where are the other rooms. You don't necessarily have to know all the details, but you need to know generally where they are. If you don't have that spelled out, you can have the vision, you can then build all the details, but then you'll be missing and say, oh, one second, maybe the living room belongs here. That's in the structure of a building. If you're writing a book. Before you even write chapters, you want to have not only chapter headings, you want to have section headings. I'll give an example from my book, Toward a Meaningful Life. And I remember vividly the experience of taking something from the abstract vision and then this first step of implementation outline. So I remember struggling, how is the structure of the book going to be presented? I knew what I wanted to convey. I wanted to convey the spiritual perspective that through the lens of my mentor, the Rebbe, which is really the lens of 90 generations of Torah thought in a universal way to all areas of life, the entire spectrum of life. That was toward a meaningful life. That was the meaning, that was the vision of the book. If someone comes away, every part of their lives is enhanced with a deeper sense of meaning and significance and purpose and urgency including the indispensable role that, each per, that you play in realizing and fulfilling that, that vision and mission of your life. 
But how do I structure it? Life is a very broad, a big word. So I remember thinking about it, and then I, rec- I recalled some reason something came to mind trying to structure. You look for those uh, models, and I studied. I studied models. I studied how different authors, different compilers, codifiers structure a lot of information. It's really what we call today information technology, which is essentially taking a lot of data but putting it in an organized form. You go to a website, one of the most important things is the structure right, the menu, the navigation. You can have great content, but if it's all over the place, like a warehouse with millions of different pieces, you want to know what's, what belongs in each section. You ever go to a, today it's maybe a new reality, but you go to a store, you go shopping online or in the physical world, you want to know where, the, where, each, uh, where each department has. This is the clothing department, this is the the tool department, this is the, the, the plant department, this is the furnishings. So I remember thinking, how would I structure all of life into to digestible and easy to use, user-friendly experience? And based on a, actually a statement in the Pirkei Avot, which is the ethics of the fathers, that there are three things a person should always focus on in order to keep aligned in their life. And it was those three things that struck me. And I structured the book, this was structure, outline, into three categories, which in, in turn encompass all the subcategories that would need to be covered. The first was called man, society, and God. Different way of putting it, personal, social, and theological. So personal was everything that was involved in your personal life, your interpersonal life with others. We'll talk about the chapters in a moment. The social was social things like things like responsibility, government, technology, women and men, responsibility. And then the theological were things of faith, unity, God, good and evil. In the personal, these chapters were, and they are, in this order, body and soul. I felt that was a good place to begin. And then the chronological order of our lives, birth, childhood, Education, youth, marriage, love, intimacy, work and productivity, health, and health, aging and retirement, death, fear and anxiety. You get the idea. So the first most important thing, and that really was such a, uh, I can't explain how much time that saved, not just time, it created in my mind that structure. I was able then to take and distill many ideas and put each one, okay, this belongs in, the, in, in bucket number one, bucket number two, bucket number three. That's an example. So in each project, what you want to do is once you have established the vision, you want to create the outline. Now, of course, different, different projects or different books would diff- have different outlines, but all of them have one thing in common. It's a general outline that allows you to begin to break it down into details, but not into such fine-tuned details that that you or anyone else will get overwhelmed. Three categories in the case that I just explained. But in those three categories, each one had 17 chapters, six chapters, another seven chapters, then a total for 30 or ultimately 31 chapters. Now, of course, chapters are also part of the outline, but that's the subcategory. So I had three categories. Each one had... And if you look at it as an outline, like inde- an indent, a tab, so now you have three main categories and you have chapters in each one, and we haven't even begun writing the chapters. Now, of course, in the process of working, I, I played around with it. I may have changed some titles of chapters. I may have encompassed two chapters. That goes without saying that it's going to happen as you continue to produce it. But you want to begin with this type of structure. Of course, it's the long, short road, which means it forces you now to take your ideas and whatever concept and turn it into something that can be presented. That's why in a business plan, you don't just have a whole bunch of pages. You have sections. Let's begin with the vision. Let's begin with the executive summary. And then you start spelling it out, the needs, target audience. That's all outline. Now, those that have experience know these outlines on the back of their hand. Like if you go to a business plan writer, they will tell you, here's the outline, now let's fill it in. You go online, say, give me a business plan. 
No one's going to write the business plan for you in your specific details, but you, what you will have is you will have a uh, good outlines out there. You know, every business plan needs to have a mission statement, an executive summary. It needs to talk about the needs. Need, you have to have the, who's the target audience, who's the competition, best case scenario, worst case scenario. What's the production plan? What's the tactical plan? What's the marketing plan? A budget? You're missing any of all, all those items. The whole thing will not stand properly. You're building a home. A home needs to have, as I mentioned earlier, things that are necessary. Then there are things that are optional. So the outline becomes the bridge between vision into action. But it's called Bria because Bria in Hebrew means to create something. The next third step is going to be called Yitzira, which means to shape something. To create and shape is not the same thing. Create means getting the basic, basic uh, um, ingredients and elements in place. The basic structure, infrastructure, outline, and so on. And then you will start fleshing it out and shaping it. But then the shape follows the outline, not the other way around. But again, because we're human beings, none of us are going to be perfect. You want to do the best you can, you can always go back. And say, you know what, I may have to rework some of that outline. It's not clear. I was just advising someone who wants to write a book about their family. They're saying, where do I begin? So I said, the first place you begin, make a document and just outline it by decades. When, does your fa when do you want to begin the story? And even that the person hadn't thought of. He says, that's a good question. Should I begin with my parents or with my grandparents or great-grandparents? I said, wherever the point is, Begin, let's say it's the year 1800. So 1800, 1810, 1820, 1830. If you want larger spans, make it 1800, 1850, 1900. And then whatever information you find, put it into that bucket, into that file. That's a file. And it could be digital. And just that structure alone creates so much, uh, <laughs> so much calm. Because not anything comes your way. You just dump it in there. We're not even talking about organizing it within that structure. But once you have that, you already have something. Instead of getting all the data information, the interviews, the pictures, the documents that you'll need to do this, you now have a place to put them. Now you're going to go to each section and then start organizing it further. So that was the first step, is creating an outline of, in this case, a chronology. But it all depends, again, on the project. If it's something involving, let's say, with your children, you want to create a, a strategic plan, especially in these days, of your children at home. So you can divide it in between schooling, play, and entertainment. Be socializing with friends, family time, going out. Once you create that, things become organized. But I want to make a key point here. This is not about coming too square where you get so stuck in structures and you lose the spontaneity and adventure of it all. Keep that in mind. The structure is there in order to organize. It's not in order to limit and confine. So there we have step number two. Atsilus, vision, and now outline. Let's talk about it a little deeper now. There's an expression that says, created, he created darkness and he shaped light. So the question is asked, why is the word created used by darkness and shape by light? The answer, obviously, is because when you have a raw piece of material that's not been shaped yet, a piece of gold, a piece of clay, or an idea that you have in general terms, you can't call it yet shaped. Light, darkness, is not just that it's dark, it also means it's not yet clear what the structure is. You ever see a construction site? So they're all common in a certain way. Obviously, their size may be different. And if you're a trained eye, you maybe could see the differences. But they all have certain basics. You see the foundation being built. You see the outline. You see the girders, the, the beams, the, all the cranes, everything that's there. It's a construction site. It'll take time till you begin to see what this building is going to look like. Now, those that are following the blueprint know exactly where they want it to look like. But at that stage, the outline stage, it's still shrouded, we'll call it, in a certain darkness because it's still a general outline. 
Now, I understand when it comes to a book, it's not exactly that way because you do see something. But relatively speaking, the level step three is going to be called light because then you start really seeing the detailed shape of something. Whenever you see, whether it's a potter or it's someone who creates ornaments out of gold or other precious metals, the first stage, it looks very similar. Because they're just beginning the stage of, of the beginning the, the process of shaping it, not really shaped yet. The first thing is to create that general shape before they go and create the specifics. So, in the language of the the Kabbalists, is therefore that this is called darker and this is called light. But darkness is which are often associated with negative doesn't really mean darkness in a negative sense. It means that before you get to a specific illuminated detail. You want to have a more general structure. Now, when you think of it that way, what, what does that tell us in the, in the context of the cosmic level? On the cosmic level, it talks about Atsila, step one, as being a vision. A vision does not yet have substance. Yes, of course, you can articulate it, you can write it down, but in concept, it's about vision. It's actually meant not to have substance. It's meant to be an overarching, almost reality check that hovers above the whole project, whatever the project may be, and unifies all the details. On the other hand, step two is in the language of the Kabbalists, it begins to have substance. Because now you have something that's being structured. It's still an outline, but it's something that's being structured. So sometimes the expression used is an interesting expression that the mystics use and explain the Hasidic text. It's called, I'll use the Hebrew word, Efsharius Hametzius. It means you have now the potential of something that's existent. So why is it called potential? Because when we're talking on, on the spiritual realms, and we'll soon translate that in our terms, it's not, it's not quite non-existent as the vision, which is completely ethereal and amorphous, a vision. On the other hand, it's not, you can't call it a full existence yet. So you say it's the possibility of existence, it means there's an existence that is beginning to emerge. To use an example, upon conception, when a child is conceived. So preconception, you can call a state of vision. If you want to speak in terms of God, it would be God's vision of the soul that is about to enter this new, this new body at the moment of conception. If you want to speak from the perspective of parents, the child they envision, which may not be accurate, but at least there's a vision for it. So vision is not yet even a conception. And then, after the intimacy between husband and wife, in a, in a sacred way, what happens next? If it's blessed, the seed will fertilize the egg, and a, 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 a new cell will be conceived. But for 18 hours, this cell will not split. But this cell has everything that this child will be, in a concentrated form, in a very concentrated form, minuscule, like a seed. Exactly like that. In this case, an egg that's fertilized by a seed. But like a seed in the ground, an apple seed. You look at it, it's a little seed. But you allow it to grow. You nurture it, what happens? It will develop into a mighty apple tree. Or for that matter, any type of tree. The same thing here. This cell, this concentrated cell, now will, will split and then split again and split again. And if you watch the development and the gestation of the fetus through its stages, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, you actually will see the development. Today we have, due to technology, the wonder of the development in the, of the embryo from its earliest stage all the way to a full-blown healthy child born approximately nine months later. So we have with our very eyes, even though you need technology, you don't see it physically, and it takes the time that it takes, we have, we actually have, see the process from vision, the conception is step two. What does it look like? It looks like, it doesn't look like details yet. There's no arms and legs, there's no head or heart. That will only happen in the, in the next few months that will begin to discern the shape and form of this body. That's how it is. Now, that tells you something. Because that tells you that's the healthy process of how something develops. Applying that to us, 
teaches us how we should create something as well. It should also be in that form or fashion. I'm not getting down to whether it should be a gestation of nine months or, t- or 18 months. That depends on the project. But it goes from what we call from the general to the specific. So vision turns into outline, structure, which will then be the general outline, like in the case of the fetus, the head, and then the emerging, the other organs will begin to develop and emerge until it all becomes a full-shaped body. And when you talk about the third trimester, you can see the child in the full intensity. The mother feels the child. And then, of course, upon birth, the umbilical, the umbilical cord is cut. So when you say that one cell at the beginning of the process, at, at the point of conception, is that a metzius? Is that an existent entity or is it non-existent? Compared to the vision beforehand, you can't call it. It's, of course, something's there. There's something of substance. But compared to the fully fleshed out and, de- and developed ch- fetus and child, you can say it's still in a state of potential. But it's not potential purely in the conceptual level. It's potential in the actual level. So we call it potential within implementation. That's the level of outline. When you study this in the Kabbalistic texts, though it's in the cryptic language and hard to understand without being trained, it's fascinating because it demonstrates how this, this process repeats itself throughout the cosmic order many, many times over. In other words, it's not a one-time thing. Every level, as it moves to the next level, the spiritual evolution of reality, of existence, has to go through these four steps that we're addressing. And in the case we're discussing now, step number two. So you have it on the microcosmic level, on the macrocosmic level. Wherever you turn, you will find how vision turns into outline. Step one into step two which will prepare it to go to the next steps. Another point that Kabbalists explained, which I think is a very vital one in our context, is that there's a partition. They call it a partition between vision and outline. What's the purpose of the partition? The the vision is intense. It's supposed to have within it everything, the, 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 the objective, the goals, the unification of all the details that will ultimately emerge. So the vision is very intense, and it needs to be that way because it is going to be the reality check. It will be the, the, the voice of truth, so to speak, to make sure that the project is living up to what the, vision, the visionary's vision was. When you get to the state of outline, you, you don't want to be overwhelmed by the vision or else you won't be able to create a structure. And when you get excited about an idea and you're really passionate about it, that's vital. And you have a very strong vision. You now need some restraint, which is why so many people who are visionaries are not builders. Because their passion and their strength is in vision area. Very many companies, the visionary is not the implementer. The person who's doing the execution is a different type of person. It's a different personality. It's someone who has to be much more focused on getting it done than on the passion of the vision itself. Can the two be combined? Of course we want them combined, but they don't often come together in the same person. So the way it's explained is actually on a microcosmic level. This may be familiar to some of you. You know the concept of the ten spheres. So the ten spheres also break into four steps. And I'll be explaining them in each of the in each of these parts of this course. So what's step one in the spheres? It's called Chachma, the concept. It's true that we're talking about the concept on the visual level. That's what Chachma is. What's Bina? Bina is the outline. You're now outlining it out. It will then take on more shape when we go into step three, which will be the emotional part of the structure, which really breaks it down into the details. So Chachma and Bina, concept, and comprehension in many ways is like Atzila Sambria, which is vision and outline. Now I know you may be familiar that Bina is more than just outline, it breaks it into details, but I'm talking now relatively speaking. So Chachme is the, maintains the, preserves the integrity, it's the reality check. And Bina begins to lay it out, but in order to be able to have the comprehension, you have to somewhat pause. 
Or a better way of putting it is lower the volume of the intensity and the passion of the vision. And hence the partition, which can be translated into having a second person who's in the execution level. Here, I bring you a vision. Now I'd like you to lay out a game plan, an outline, a structure. How are we going to get it done? Which will begin with an outline. Or the partition can be within yourself. The need to now move from vision to action, which begins with outline. I've experienced this many times, getting caught up in the vision. It's very difficult sometimes to restrain yourself and to limit yourself into the outline because firstly you start saying to yourself, well, why this outline may be another outline. You can, you can drive yourself nuts just trying to figure out which way to implement and that's why you need someone who's maybe a little more distant from the passionate vision who can be more practical about it. Secondly, the vision itself doesn't lend itself to specifics. You know, you're dreaming about what your home, your dream home is going to look like or the end of your book, what kind of book it's going to be for the reader. It's hard to think in that when you're thinking in that sense, when you're in that state of mind, think about the specific sections or chapters. And there are other factors that need to be somewhat mitigated and somewhat quieted down as you move from vision to outline, which also is a critical component in appreciating these steps. So to sum up, to sum up, we're talking about a four-step process based on the Kabbalistic model of building something, of creating something, producing, from abstract concept all the way to a final product. And this impacts every aspect of our lives, no matter what it is that you're building or writing or composing. And it also creates order in your own life, even on a daily basis. You know, wake up in the morning, you should have a vision for your day. I'm talking about a more specific vision. Then you begin the outline. And then you begin to implement it in details until you have the final product. So we've covered step two. It's step two called outline. As I suggested in step one, in part one of this course, take out a journal and, and, and have a second section called, talk about organization, called after vision, where you lay out your vision, here's your outline. And don't be afraid to use a pencil or, or if you're doing it on a computer, and you can change and you can shift. Nothing is etched in stone. But what you're doing is creating the very basic elements for the proper journey. Like any good journey, you want to lay out the steps. So we've done step number two, outline. Now, in this step three of this course, we'll be addressing the next logical step, and that is shaping the outline. So we'll be addressing how you shape the details. You know, there's the expression, God is in the details. Some say the devil is in the details. But depending whether you look at the to know whether something is good or something won't work, I guess those are the two expressions. So details matter. But details cannot be the beginning of a process. If you begin with the detail and move from the detail to the overall picture, something's wrong. You want to go from outline to details, from outline to shape, not from shape to outline. First, you want the general skeleton of the infrastructure that it is you're creating. And then you want to flesh it out. And all that is driven by the vision. So the eloquence of this is amazing. The vision informs all the steps. The outline begins to create the proper structure. And now, how do we shape that in a way that's aligned with the outline, which is aligned with the vision, but now is taking on shape and form? So if you recall, in the last part, part two, we talked about outline. So, for example, let's say you're writing an outline of a, for an article or for a book. We know you don't begin writing every, de every line, every word. First, you begin with the sections. And from the sections, you move to the chapters. And the chapters then break down further subcategories and subcategories, sub-subcategories. That's an outline. So the outline is now we have a skeleton. But, but why can't we stop right here? Because you still don't have a product. What you have is the vision and you have outline. Now you want to start filling it in. And here's the beautiful part of it. When the details and the shape follow the outline, they begin to really 
become exquisite. If they don't, they become they can actually become a uh, chaotic to the point of actually undermining the entire project. That is why it's vital to go in this order. So once you have an outline, which is based on the vision, now you begin to spell out the details. And to do this, we need to be very meticulous, very meticulous. When it comes to shape and form, the critical component here is that every piece, every component is measured exactly right. So let's begin. A person has a vision of expressing a certain feeling and sentiment in writing or through music or art or poetry or any other form or fashion. That vision is amorphous and doesn't yet have any details in it. So the next step, of course, is to begin to create the main structure. But now you want that structure to begin to become detail-oriented. So I use the example of my own book, Toward a Meaningful Life, simply something that's close to me and I learned on the job. So I'll, let, me, let me take that as an example. So there, if I, you recall, I wrote an outline. The outline was the sections of the book. They were personal, interpersonal. The next section was social. And the third was theological. Or another way of putting it, man, society, God. Basically, three components in our lives where we interact with each other or our own, inter, our own inner issues which that can include everything from birth to childhood to education to uh, business to uh, health, anxiety, and so on. The social, which covers our social lives, responsibility, uh, science, women and men, and so on. And the third was more of our so-called spiritual lives. God, faith, unity, good and evil, redemption, miracles, so that's an outline. The outline obviously is driven by the title, in my case, the book Toward a Meaningful Life, that the entire book is meant to help people live a more meaningful life. But to live a meaningful life, you have to break down what the life is like. So now you have the chapters. But let's move now to shape. What does the shape look like? So then each chapter, now we're focusing on, I'm just going to take one example, birth. What is the meaningful life aspect of birth? So we already have the vision part, which is the general concept of a meaningful life. The specific outline, the outline, rather the general outline, is that we're dealing now with this life cycles and more specifically birth. But now comes the question, birth. What do we know about birth? And how do we make our understanding birth in a, deep, in a deeper way that helps you appreciate its meaningful nature? So here, the details are vital. If you don't have the details spelled out, the promise was made, but someone starts reading, there's nothing to read. Or what's re being read is not presented in a, in, a con in a cohesive fashion. So I began that chapter with a quote. Birth is God saying you matter. Quote that has become quite popular. Birth is God saying you matter. That is an example of a particular line, a one line, which is already the shape of the chapter. It's not the outline of the chapter. It's, yes, it's a one-liner, like a headline, but then now we need to make the case to, to, to uh, the case that compels us to say that birth is God saying you matter. In other words, birth, your birth is essentially telling you that you are indispensable and you have a unique contribution to make. And expressing that through anecdotes, through explanation, through stories, through analogies is the shape and form of that particular chapter. It's just an example. The same example can be applied anywhere in life. So let's go, let's do the exact, second example, building a structure. Building a home, a structure. So the vision is you want to have a home that with your spouse, you're going to build a beautiful family. And the family will have a playroom, the bedrooms, obviously, the other rooms, but it'll also be a home that's filled with energy and good vibes. So you want it to be spacious, well-lighted, a nice view out the window, the vision of it is the, is the central component that you want a home that will reflect your soul, that will reflect your aspirations. That's a very general statement. That's the vision that drives the home. And the purpose of it is to, is to bring up a healthy family, to, to influence and, and radiate light to all those that enter this home. Not just a shelter that protects you from the elements, but a vision behind the home. 
What is the outline? The outline is now you sit down with an architect, with a designer, and you plan it. And what's the plan? The architect lays out, so, okay, so how are we going to do this? How many rooms do you want? What kind of rooms? The size of the rooms. This is now all general outline of what the structure is going to look like, which will satisfy the vision. If you begin step two before step one, you're not going to have what you're looking for. Then comes, once you have that outline, then you say, okay, so let's now cover the living room. What do you want in this living room? So you'll say, this living room, as I see it, I want to have a few couches. I want to have some paintings on the wall. I want it to be lined with books. I want a piano in there. Now, why do you want these details? Because these details satisfy what the outline dictated, which satisfy what the vision dictated. That's the order. And the, this makes total sense. I mean, this everyone can figure out with common sense. But this is step three. The step three called Yitzira in the Hebrew word, in the Kabbalistic model. Yitzira means surah, in Hebrew means shape. Bria in step two meant the raw outline. It doesn't yet have the shape of details. And Yitzira, the step three, is about the details. But the details that are aligned to the outline, which is aligned with the vision. Now, you could say, well, what did you learn new? This seems to be very logical. Everybody understands this. Well, I'll show you where it can get more complicated. Let's talk about our personal lives. The vision that we have, for example, in our relationships. A relationship is an emotional experience with another person. I would say more than emotional. It's all-encompassing experience. You want to have a healthy relationship. Now, you can say, so how does, these, how does this four-step Kabbalistic model help us in relationships? Let me tell you. Love, which is a key component in a good relationship, and a healthy relationship, a necessary component. So love, is it driven by a vision? Does it have an outline structure? Does it have details? Many of us just fall into love without any training, without any experience. And we come with our baggage. If we grow up in a loving home, beautiful. So we have modeling. We have something that we emulate. If we grow up in a dysfunctional home, that becomes usually our modus operandi. But when you use this model, you can actually evaluate how you love. Is love driven by a vision? And I'll put it perhaps in a different context. I've spoken many times about the idea that every relationship needs different elements of compatibility. So we talk about physical compatibility. We talk about emotional compatibility, intellectual compatibility, and then there's spiritual compatibility. Vision-oriented compatibility. Let me explain. Physical compatibility is two people are attracted to each other physically, sexually. There's an attraction. That is obviously part of every relationship. Second level two is emotional. You can be attracted to someone physically, but there's no emotional connection. There's no there's no uh, chemistry. You know, you can fall in love with a model in a magazine, and then if you meet that person, there's nothing. There's no emotional stimulation. So an emotional relationship. Compatibility is a second level. The third level is intellectual compatibility. You can be emotionally attracted to someone, emotionally connected. You might have certain emotional chemistry, but the mind, the ideas, do you respect each other's ideas? Do you share ideas? Can you communicate and even learn from each other? So these three, as we shall see in a moment, correspond to three levels that we will be talking about. And then comes four, level four. Level four we'll call visionary compatibility or spiritual compatibility, that you share a vision together. What kind of home do you want to build? What kind of mark do you want to make in the universe? As a couple, what synergy do you want to exude? That's the vision. Now, I went backwards just simply because most of us do that. We go backwards. We start, oh, I'm physically attracted to you. Let's go out on a date. And then, do we work out whether we have emotional, intellectual, and vision? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. The truth is, it should begin the other way around. What is a soulmate? First, you have some vision of your own soul. Then you see another soul is compatible with me. And of course, you're then looking for the intellectual, the emotional, and the physical. If you only have step one, it may work for a while, but it's going to be very, uh, very weak because it doesn't have anything to stand on. And what happens if your spouse suddenly gets a little older and they're not that physically attractive and you see someone else that's more physically attractive? What you want in a healthy, loving relationship, what will happen, of course, is 
You may, your eyes may wander and you may not be that committed. The same thing with emotional and intellectual. Even they're more powerful because they're more internal, but they still are subjective and they go through changes. You know, sometimes you look for novelty. Someone that you know well, you get accustomed to. You don't feel emotionally stimulated. And the same thing with intellectual. But when there's a vision, the vision is what binds, bonds you that transcends the differences and the changes that happen in our lives in the intellectual, emotional, and biological or physical dimension. So when it comes to love, you want to have vision, which is that first step. Second step, you want to have outline the general structure, which is the intellectual compatibility. So the first level called Atsilis would be the vision of your love. The second would be called the structure of your love. But the outline, not the specific details. The outline is that we have general ideas that we share, general concepts, general values, which can be either vision or outline. But then comes step three, which we're addressing here, and that is the details. What is the shape and form of your relationship? How does it manifest on a daily basis? What does breakfast look like? Lunch? Dinner? What does a holiday look like? What about when you're at work? What do you do when there's a conflict? So outline is good for the overall structure which is necessary to maintain a healthy environment and a healthy relationship. But love comes down to details. How do you communicate with each other? Are you kind? Are you generous in the specifics? So if someone says, you know, I love you in general, we both love each other, very often relationships fall apart and are compromised because the details are not being cared for. And people say, okay, you know, we love each other, we don't even have to work on it. No, the details matter. Details can come down to how you have a conversation, how you take a walk. So there suddenly you see, if you think about it that way, how many of our relationships are, are detail-driven but the details are not driven by the outline, which is driven by the vision. The details just come our way. And what happens is, let's say, there's a certain conflict and there's no re resolution because it does, it's, not, it's not been structured in the proper fashion. Many of us love and we have good love inside of us and our intentions are good. But no one ever trained us in the basics of spending time with another. How to say thank you, gratitude. How do you disagree in a civil way? How do you make up? So then we go by, uh, we wing it, based again by instincts or based usually by what we saw in our childhood, in our formative years. So what I'm suggesting is just like when you write a book, you go from vision, outline to details, and it's all in that order. The details are informed by the outline, which is informed by the vision. And the same thing with the building a building. You don't first get the bricklayers or you don't first get an interior designer to discuss the details of the living room if you don't know what your general house wants to, is going to look like. And the general house you don't begin building until you know what the vision of your home is. But unfortunately, in our lives, most of us begin somewhere in the middle. We will be talking about step four, which is really the final product. Many of us actually begin with step four before we have three, two, and one in place. But we're talking now about three. Many of us have step three before we have two and one in place. It's like starting to write the details of chapters in a book without having an outline, without having a vision. Can you do it? Of course you can write lines, and later those lines can be put together, and you could build a vision from that. But sometimes you do it that way, but you're going to need, at some point, you're going to need that vision. You're going to need that cohesiveness of that unifying element that connects all the details of your narrative, all the characters. So yes, many people write a book, they develop, it's centered around one character, one interesting, colorful character, and then you develop it from there outward, but you're going to have to then go back to the outline and to the vision, regardless. So, but if, if the detail informs the rest, it usually will not work well. Now, of course, there are exceptions and there are certain circumstances where a detail becomes a center component, but then the detail may be part of the vision. For example, if you're writing a biography and you're writing, a, so there may be one specific episode in that person's life that is the central theme of the book. So then that's the vision and that then informs the rest of it. So in a way, the detail becomes part of the vision. But I don't want to complicate matters. Let's bring it back to where we are now. So we're talking about the shape, the details. And the details matter. They really matter. Many people, especially dreamers and thinkers and 
big picture, bird's eye view people put far more emphasis on the vision and not on the details. And the details is where we make or break it. The execution of the details. Even if you have a vision and an outline that's solid, we always need to have the capacity to flesh it out. And there are people actually that are very good at that. I mentioned that as well in previous, the previous parts of this course, that there are people who are good at giving you the general idea, the concept. They conceive well, but they don't flesh it out well. So this level of Yitzir is fleshing it out. And yes, this is more of the emotional dimension in a relationship. Because it's the emotions that are detail-oriented. Even though the intellectual is a framework and, into, and the mind also has details, but its main focus there is, you know, we, like, our minds think alike. We're of like mind. We have certain ideas that we share. We think alike, etc. When it comes to emotions, emotions are, we're far more nuanced and we're far more diverse. People's emotions are very different from one another. And reactions are stronger. So in this st third step, it's vital that with the details be critical. Some people react one way. Some people, you say something to them, they're fine. Another person may be much more sensitive. And if you say the same thing, they become very defensive and very hurt. So we, we have to understand that. We have to be sensitive to it in the context of love. And I'm, I, so I use three examples. I use the book. My example from my book, I use the example of a structure, a building, and I use the example of a relationship. The truth is you can apply this to any given situation where you need these steps. So let's talk a little bit about more about the details. So I mentioned last in the last part, I mentioned that the expression that the Kabbalists use, they, they say darkness is shaped, I'm sorry, the, the second step creates darkness, which is still too vague, it's not defined. And Yetzer R is the Hebrew expression, and creating darkness and shaping light. So darkness, and darkness simply means it's still not defined in detail, is, is, a, is a general construct, structure, construct. And details require shape. When, some, when you shine the light on something, now you want the details. That's what light does. It's not shrouded in general terms or shrouded in a, in a dark state. It's now specific. It's not a raw piece of clay or a raw piece of pottery or a raw piece of gold, but it's being shaped in the details. So when you create, let's say, an ornament and you take a piece of raw um, precious stone, it could be a raw diamond, a raw, raw gold, raw silver, copper, or whatever it may be. So that, of course, is vital because everything is going to be shaped within that substance. But what is the beauty and what is really going to be the thing that attracts someone is the shape and form. You turn it into a diamond ring, into a necklace, into a bracelet. These are details. This is step three. Now, obviously, step three is an outgrowth of step two because you can't shape a beautiful necklace of pearls if you don't have pearls. You can't create a beautiful uh, diamond ring if you don't have a raw, the diamond in the rough, the raw diamond. But the raw diamond is considered the second step. And the outline is considered once it's being shaped. And we see some people are excavators of the raw. And there are others that are excellent craftsmen who shape something into a beautiful ornament. And the same is true in writing a book. Writing, anyone that does writing knows, there's really two steps in writing. Well, three, three, three steps. There's the vision, which we have addressed. Step number two is you need the raw outline. But there's another step before you get to the shape and form. You write the first draft. The first draft has many ideas in it. You can't say that it's been polished. Step two is polishing the prose that now you get down to get, eliminate redundancies, make sure the flow is beautiful, paragraphs are structured nicely. So in good writing, that's what you do. The first thing is get your ideas on paper. A chapter that will end up being 10 pages may, end, may begin by 80 pages redundancies and many overlap. Many times you write the same idea several different ways. Then comes step three, the Yitzira step, is the shaping. A shaper is a very particular skill. You know, some writers actually do both together, but it's sometimes much easier that you write your draft, you get all your ideas out, but then someone else who is a, is a good editor and a polisher of prose turns it into that shining uh, or uh, shining and glowing diamond. 
So there's the diamond in the rough in stage two, and stage three is that you've turned it into a beautiful element here. Now, we're going to be speaking about stage four, what that adds to the picture, but we're not there yet. So here, it's interesting. Here, the focus is on the fine-tuning it, and fine-tuning is critical. Let's use education as yet another example. Building an education. Educating our children, educating our students. So any good school, any good classroom, good teacher will have a vision. What are we going to accomplish students this year? Even broader vision, what are we going to accomplish through your, all your years of your schooling years until you graduate? So there's a vision of what we want to share, what we want those students to come away with as we prepare them for adulthood. So this can include how much knowledge you're going to share with them, a way of thinking, not just what to think, but how to think. It's going to include, hopefully, also a series of values, moral values, how to behave, etiquette. So it's both knowledge and also methodology and also character development. That's a vision. Now, the specific vision could be which school defines how they see the standards and so on. Now, that vision is very nice, but that vision right now is a concept. You turn the next thing is you turn, an, turn it into an outline. Okay, how are we going to live up to that? So an outline means we're going to need classes in character development. We're going to need classes in the different sciences, the physical, social, and political sciences, classes in different subjects to create that rounded out character, the individual that will grow. We need... Um, I mentioned character, though we need science. We need also methodology. So those are general terms. You, it, it, that includes the outline, what will be studied in class in grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. But this is still not step three. Step three is getting the right teacher who will then take, let's say in grade one, we're going to establish the basics. You're going to learn ABC. You're going to learn basic principles. I'm just using it as an example. You can jump right away to grade 8 or to grade 12 or whatever it may be. So each one, each class needs the proper teacher who will now fine-tune. And this is where success and failure happens. Obviously, if you don't have a vision and you don't have an outline, you can fail just at, right before you get out of the gate. But the real success is going to be what happens in the implementation level, in the implementation of the shaping how does the teacher communicate to the students? The teacher may have a great curriculum, have, may have great ideas, but maybe the teacher just doesn't have the, the instinct, doesn't know how to reach the students, is not motivating, is not inspiring, is not liked. The teacher may be too weak and the children take advantage. So now you're dealing with real details of that particular classroom. Now this is true also at home. The child at that stage, are they getting the details covered? So there we go, a whole focus, a whole study, just on shaping and forming something. And when that's not in place properly, as I said, you can have a great idea, a great outline, but the bottom line is missing. That is why it's so vital to have that, those details going. And details come, we'll give another example. You're going to make a presentation, a presentation for an investment, or a presentation to be, you're being, to, to be hired by somebody, or a presentation in school. So vision is what do you want to get across? What do you want the people to go away with? What is the overriding picture you want to convey? Outline is that you're going to lay it out now. I'm going to be presenting the next half hour. That half hour is going to consist of, let's say, 10 components of, of three minutes each adding up to 30 minutes. These are, this is the outline. And then comes, what are you going to say in each of those three minutes? The first three minutes, are you going to open with a humor? Are you going to open with a powerful hook? Next three minutes, you're going to get into the topic. Each of the minutes is calculated and detailed. I'm just using that again as an example. It could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It's not the three. The idea is that they all follow from one another. If a person is a very polished presenter, they may be able to convey something very clearly, but then someone will say, leave and say, one second, um, what, did, what was really the message here? There are people who have this gift of gab, and it sounds very logical when you hear them, but it's lacking vision. It's lacking some cohesive message here. Or 
The structure was not well presented. The details were presented well, but not in the right order. So you could see that how step three has to follow step one and two. And step three is absolutely necessary because if you have one and two well, and you say, you know, I'm going to outline now, in the next 30 minutes, we're going to cover 10 points or five points, just to make it a little simpler. And now you have to deliver on, on your promise, on, which, on your outline. And you deliver by, implement, by defining exactly what it is that you want to communicate and not remain vague and not remain uh, and no platitudes and not remain um, uh, abstract, but becomes concrete. So level three, Yitzira, Tzura, is giving shape and form to a raw concept which in turn was informed by a overriding vision, unified vision. And that is a step three. The Kabbalistic terminology, as I said, it's the world called Yitzira, after Bria. So one more point in the mystical dimension. So in the world of Bria, things begin to shape. And I, at vision doesn't have a shape in the tangible sense. Yes, it's a, the f- shape of the vision, what the vision is, but the tangibility of it, the concreteness, is not there yet. In the world of Bria, in the second step, you have a what's called a, 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 uh, the beginnings of substance. But in step three, the substance is now being shaped in detail. So if you look at a fetus developing, and we spoke about that, the vision of that, of that newborn or that new conceived child is the soul of the child, what that soul is going to be like. The first steps... The first stage is the first trimester, or earlier probably, you only have is one cell that then splits into two cells, into four and eight and so on. In early stages, if you look at the fetus, it's tiny, and it's all concentrated in a Bria form. It's an outline form. You begin to see the shapes after a while, but when does the child become a fully developed fetus is as it develops further, you start seeing. You see the head, then you see the arms and legs budding, and the other organs begin to develop. That obviously a viable life is only when you have step three. And then, of course, comes step four, which we will discuss next, the next part of this, the final part of this series. What is the final touch that creates a full dimensional entity? So wherever you turn, you will find these stages. So in this third dimension, in the Kabbalistic language, what's happening is that existence is beginning to not just come into, it's come into being, it's coming into shape into real specific shapes. But like in any given situation, the more defined and shaped it is, the more it can lose sight of its overall driving vision and outline. That's why it's critical. That's step three. As a reality check, is always being, being evaluated and compared to and aligned with the step two and in turn step one. Because when you get lost in the details, you can sometimes get overwhelmed and lose sight of what is the goal in the first place. And you see this many times in companies and other situations where the mission is forgotten. Someone comes up with a great idea. And, and the question was, should have been asked, how does that fulfill our general vision and mission? Does it fit our outline? And if it doesn't, where did it come from? Now, that doesn't mean you can't go back to the outline and review it and revisit it. But you want to be careful that a detail doesn't suddenly inform the overall picture, but the other way around. So there you have it, my friends. Part three, the idea of details, breaking down details. And here also would help is if you're able to, if you're creating, if you have this journal that we spoke about, where you take anything you want to build and you spelled out the vision. Column two is the outline. Column three is the shape it's always good to review it with another person because another person can say, one second, I see the shape, but something's off. Maybe it's missing something. Maybe it's too much because shape also means not more than necessary, not not less than necessary. Like I explained with the chapter, when you write 90 pages or in a film, making a film, most of the the film remains on the cutting floor. The editing can be only 5% of the original footage. So you want to make sure there's nothing extra and there's nothing missing the perfect balance is in the shape and having another person to help an objective person reading it or looking at it or depending what it is that you're building reviewing it can help keep honest 
and making sure it's really being expressed, that the user experience is, 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 uh, is being satisfied due to the, the details are properly there. And then there's making sure that the, that the details are aligned with the, vi- with the outline, which in turn is aligned with the vision. We begin with vision, a vision that is the unifying principle that drives the entire project, the entire production. From there, we move to outline. And from there to shape and form. And now, the fourth step, finalize. These follow the four steps of the Kabbalistic model of creation and creation of everything. In the Hebrew, we start with the four worlds, the four dimensions. Atzilut is vision. Bria is creation. Yitzira is form and shape. Or shape and form. And finally, Asiya is finalizing. And we have the complete, the completion and the fruition of what began with a vision. So what does this fourth step consist of? And why is it so vital? It would make sense that you could be finished after you have your vision, you have your outline, your framework, your skeleton. You fleshed it out in details, as we discussed in the last session. The details, every fine detail. So what does the fourth step add? So on a very basic level, you can say it adds the polishing. You polish it. It's like when you finish a product, you clean it up, you polish it, make sure everything is in its place. A type of like checking up, making sure that everything has been built as you, according to plan. But it's far more than that. In the Kabbalistic model, and that's where let's we'll begin with, this fourth, fourth final step is actually critical. It's not just coming and get someone a double check that everything was built right. In addition to, of course, looking for any details that may have been missing, there's something more. This fourth step, interestingly, connects with the first step. Because here is where the vision has finally come to fruition. You can have, you can build something beautiful. And then the architect or the engineer will come and say something's missing. And it may not be a detail. May, not like you're missing a screw or missing a nail or missing a room or a chapter in the book. That's also possible. But something is not reflecting my initial vision. Because remember, it's not, just the sum of, it's not just the parts and the sum of the parts. It's something more, something more ethereal, something less tangible. When you write a book, and you come to the end, you finish so you've done all the three steps. You had the vision for the book, the concept. Was laid, you laid it out in the outline. Now you fleshed it out into chapters, sub-chapters, however the structure is built. But then you finish it and you go back and you read it and say, it's not capturing quite as focused or crystallized my real theme. So then you start doing little touches that are not just to clean it up, the touches are really meant to round it out because you want a cohesive picture here. Just like the vision was a unifier, in many ways the, fr- the finaliz- finalizing stage is also a unifier. It's making sure that the outline and the details are all aligned with the vision, but now in actuality, not just in theory. In the vision level, it's driven by the theory, which of course is vital because it has to begin from there. But now you're looking, does the final product and that's the question you asked. Does the final product reflect what I wanted from point number one? There's an interesting statement. In Hebrew, Sof Maisha B'Machshav Atchila. The end of the action is what arose originally in thought. Because the end of the process is what you want. You want to build a house. As vital as it is to have the outline and the skeleton and the structure and then all the rooms and so on, but at the end of the day, you want to move into this house or you want to sell it, or you want to give it to someone, or whether it's for a child, you want it to be a place that reflects what your first initial vision was. And that's more than the sum of the parts. I'll use an example. When you, let's say, compose a word, I'm going to use a word, the word blessing. It's a good word. In Hebrew, bracha, or baruch. It's made up of several letters. B-L-E-S-S, or S-S-I-N-G. So when you say the word blessing, it's much more than just the combination of those letters. 
a B and an L and an E and an S, another S, those letters independently can be part of other words that have very different meanings, even, even opposite meanings. What happens when you put letters together and they create a word? So we call it, today we call it synergy. The Kabbalists and the mystics call it a a, a, an energy that hovers above them all. Something that's more than the sum of B-L-E-S-S-I-N-G. The meaning of the word blessing. So you can spell it right. You can do everything right. But, it, but what you want here is its message that it's conveying. When you write a book, as much as the letters are critical, being a good wordsmith, choosing the right words and phrases to express your feelings, you want to make sure it's expressed. That's why often you want to give it to someone else to read, or you reread it after time, or you listen to reader to, to those that are to, to readers of the book and hear their feedback. What is that? What's happening? You're seeing that the end is aligned with the beginning. That's where step four becomes so vital. It's the finalization that you can say, "I'm ready to deliver it. It's ready to go," and that is more than just the details aligned with an outline, aligned with a vision, is that the final product has that qualitative dimension. Another example. When several people lift up any item, so mathematically speaking, if I can lift 100 pounds and you can lift 100 pounds, together we can lift at least 200, right? But we lift more than 200. There's some synergetic power something like 210 or 220 pounds. Three of us lift more than three times one. Where's that extra strength coming from? Because something happens when two things come together and work together that's more than the sum of the parts. So in this fourth dimension, in this fourth step, that's what's happening. It's more than the sum of the parts because you're bringing together a final product, which of course we all know is the key to the success. How many projects end up somewhere stuck in middle, not finished for whatever reason? So to be able to finish and finalize and say it's aligned with the vision that I initially had is a very gratifying experience. So in context of our own work, let's take the example that we've been using. One is relationships. So I explained, and I'll continue to explain now, that in relationships you have a few elements here. Let's take love, the very attribute or virtue called, faculty called love. So a person can love, it, someone sees and one person sees another person, they fall in love with each other, physical looks, emotional compatibility, intellectual compatibility, but there's no vision necessarily that drives it. So I discussed in the previous uh, classes, in this uh, series, that it could stand but more likely that at some point it will, it will fall apart because the vision is what can, keeps people together, keeps something together, even through the trials and tribulations of life. A vision also remains forever. When two people like each other, what happens when they stop liking each other? Or their looks change, or you meet someone else that's more novel or more interesting. A vision, however, is not the sum of the parts. A vision is something overriding each individual's interests. We both share something greater. That vision in turn informs the love on the outline level, which means the general way we love each other. We spoke about bringing it into the intellectual dimension and the emotional dimension, the details. And the, finally, the, the actual love as it's implemented on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's discuss this last fourth step in that context. So there are people who set out, they get married, they deeply love each other, they share vision, they share a structure together, they share the details together, their intellectual and emotional psyches are aligned with each other, but then it still doesn't work. And often it comes down to that they did not have the tools and the wherewithal to implement everything that they dreamed of. How many people say, oh, you know, I had dreams. I was idealistic. Then what happened? It didn't happen for some reason or another. 
That's some reason or other is not such a mystery if you really break it down in these four steps. Because step number four is critical in the sense of have you executed accordingly. So in execution, we spoke about the details, but now I'm talking about the final product. So if everything is right on paper, where do you see it? You see it in day-to-day activities. Do these two people who love each other get along? Especially in things that are not the big things, the small little details. How about their family that they built, their children? So the final step is going to really be the litmus test, the ultimate litmus test, whether the other first three steps have, are coming into real, real, are being realized. And that's why it's so vital in this context. So here it comes down to not so much is the vision in place, is the structure in place, is everything right on paper, is everything so-called mechanically right? Here there's something a little more intangible, and that is, is it clicking? Is it working? And if you follow those first three steps, the likelihood is that it will. But you still need to do one more thing, and that is have the humility to be able to see what's not working. Where do I need to, for example, compromise perhaps? Maybe I'm being too rigid. So even though that goes in the details, but we're talking now in action. Not everything is going to be worked out in the blueprint. You need to now also see it in action. And in action, human beings are sometimes unpredictable. So this fourth step takes into account all that, those elements, those unknowns, the unpredictability, the shifts we go through, and it makes sure that the structure, in this case, the structure called love, is a final love that is really working well. Now, it's possible that there can be a weakness or some shortcoming in the first three steps, but we're focusing now on step number four. The same is correct in a business plan. Take another extreme. You write up a business plan, the vision is there, the vision, vision statement, the mission statement, the outline, the, the details fleshed out, the executive summary is in place. But you read it, and before you present it, you say, mm, something's missing. And it could be a small nuance, but that nuance gives it that extra touch that reflects what the power of this business is, which is one of the reasons we write the executive summary at the end. And why at the end, sometimes you'll see things you could never have imagined or anticipated. So then you summarize it, and maybe even executive summary can go into this fourth step now that I think about it. You summarize it after you've done it. We're not talking about in the beginning. In the beginning, it's the vision that informs. But then comes the next, the final step is the opposite. Looking up from the final product, you see what's lacking here. And you can now apply this to any given situation, anything you're building, this fourth step, its vital component. So let's sum up now the four steps of how to be more productive. And in a very practical way, starting from the vision. Obviously, I'm not going to go over all the four lessons that we have. You can listen to them as many times as you wish. But for context purposes, just to look at it, exactly what I'm talking about. Since we did four, let's now do step number four in the context of this course itself. So we talked about vision being that overriding vision, what drives the entire project. A vision is something that is very hard to just create. You have to have it in you. It's either a passion, something that ignites, that you say, I want to achieve something, fulfill a certain goal, serve a certain need, building a home, love. And the vision is more than just a general, oh, I'd love to have that. It's about actually visualizing what it is that you want to accomplish very much connected to the calling in your life. So whatever it is that you're doing and you have that vision, that vision is going to be the one that drives, the driving engine of everything. But as we've discussed as well, vision is amorphous. A vision is, is uh, still in a, nuke, in, a, uh, in a nebulous state. What you want it to now become is translated into an outline. The outline is meant to capture the vision into an out a structure. Not everybody that has a good vision can create an outline, and vice versa. The outline then will lead to fleshing out the details, and it has to be in this order. You reorder it, or do it in a different order, it's all messed up. 
You can't begin with an outline, then go to the, the, the details, then go to an outline, then to a vision, or any other order. It has to be in this order. What is the fourth step in this context that we've been discussing? The fourth step is that now we're taking the details, which is informed by the outline, which is informed by the vision, and we're looking at it, we're stepping back and looking at it. Yes, this is the masterpiece that I wanted, that an artist can say, that a composer can say, that an architect can say, an author can say, a lover can say. Whatever area it is, it's that stepping back and looking at it, fine-tuning, as we discussed, but also making sure it carries that hovering energy that was defined by the vision. Now, not put, my point here is not to repeat myself, it's to really put it into the context of these four steps. In the Kabbalistic model, what we call Atzilus Bria Yitzira Asiya, it's extremely eloquent when you go into the details of each of these four steps, how each of them adds something that the other does not we spoke about it in context of, let's say, even shaping a uh, raw piece of material, raw piece of clay into a nice, beautiful pot, pottery. So the vision, of course, drives what do you want to create. Let's say you want to create a beautiful vase for your table or to give as a gift. Okay, so you need a vision for it. Then you need the material itself, the raw material. You just create the general shape. You then, def- shape it, you, you then do the fine-tuned shaping, which, of course, is going to create the final product. And then you finalize it. The finalizing is the touches, but also saying, does this align with what I originally intended? Now, when you apply these four steps, especially in our emotional lives, that's where it gets most complicated, because emotional lives are driven by impulse often and spontaneous. It's one thing writing a business plan. It's another thing, methodically building a structure or building a company. So there too, plenty of mistakes are made. So these four steps will be, are critical to really doing it right. But where it gets most tang- entangled is in the emotional realm of, our, in the realm of our lives because there we're not using our cognitive skills entirely. Where we say, okay, let's go by step by step. When pe- pe- two people are in love, they don't say, oh, let's go back to the blueprint. What step are we at? It takes away the... The spontaneity, it takes away the energy, the, the, the enchantment of the relationship. But yet, at times, we need to take stock and be accountable. And accountability requires looking at what's going on. We don't have to wait for trouble or problems in a relationship to go back and see whether our four steps are in place. That's why it's vital from time to time. It's going to be a beautiful exercise. Two people were together with each other, spouses, families, it could be parents and children, it could be with friends, and sit down and just take these four steps and say, let's look at our lives. It's a great way to get a, get, begin. You sit down with another person, people care you care about, and say, you know, I heard about a new idea, or maybe it's not such a new idea, this Kabbalistic model. Let's try it out in our lives and begin any way you like. What vision do you have in any area? I have a vision my children should be professionals contribute to this world. Okay. And go through the four steps and see how that vision has informed what and how, how, it, how it ended up or where it is. Maybe you're in the middle of it. I assure you that not only will it be entertaining, but it'll be surprising because it forces you in a good way to look at what you are, who you are, what you're doing, and how it's driven by either random circumstances, which unfortunately is often the case, or how much is driven by that type of organization. Now, I don't want to make this, make this too rigid, that everything must actually run like a machine. We are human beings, after all. And always keep that in mind. You don't want to start forcing yourself into a structure that is superimposed and feels forced. But at the same time, you want things to be done in the most effective and productive possible way. And to do that, it's critical and necessary to look at it at time to time. As I said, this exercise would be very, very interesting. Try it out. Take any area. It doesn't have to be the big ones in your life. You can move to the big ones later. It can be something smaller. I just was speaking to a group of people who, of course, under COVID, we've all become more tentative and all kinds of challenges. And I suggested these four steps to them, especially when you're in lockdown or you can't travel as much, because it's so easy to lose control when 
control has been taken from us, when life is disrupted, that's vital to regain control by creating some type of structure. Now, P BC, before COVID, people didn't feel the need for it. They, fought, they felt that they had control. They had their schedules coming and their summer schedule plans and their travel. And whether it was going to the theater or going to a restaurant or uh, whatever it was, everybody had their, nobody was thinking twice about their plans. But suddenly when those plans were disrupted, then it's an excellent opportunity to step back and say, okay, what is the vision of my life? What's the vision of what I'm doing? Even again, on, even on a small level, on a small scale, of projects that you're right now involved in. And as I said, it will always be illuminating. Hardly are you ever going to find a perfect situation. So there'll always be, you can say, you know what, my vision is strong, but my outline is not that great. My outline is excellent, but the details are not. Or all three are in place, but the finalized step is not. Or it could be the other way around. You can have things that are good, better on the lower levels, and the vision is not so strong in place. So it's interesting to be able to identify in, these four, in this four-step process where you're strong, what needs improvement, what needs enhancement. Every area of life, you subject these four step, this four-step formula, I assure you, it will become a more productive, more actualized, and above all, the actualization of your very purpose in life. Because at the end of the day, the big vision is you. Why are you here? that big vision mission statement. Why are you here? It's very hard to answer such a big question. But when you take these four steps in whatever area of life, it can help bring you back. Okay, so now the question is, what is the vision of my life? I would like to live a long, healthy life. But would, what mark would you like to make? What contribution? Using the skills, the talents, the acquired knowledge and experience you've gained, in any given area. And then the next three steps, the vision turns into some outline, the outline of your life. Now I know many of us will look back and say, I can't change what happened in the past. But you know, an interesting thing, whatever happened in the past is still part of your narrative. It's still part of your story. And when you have the vision in place, the outline, even though the outline is perhaps directing the future, but it could also encompass the past because the past is part of who you are. It's taught, you who, who, it's taught you what you know today. Kierkegaard famously said, we can only understand our life backwards, but we have to live our lives frontwards. So when we look back, many times things that may have seemed random, may have seemed accidental, may have seemed unwanted even, become part of your story, part of your narrative. So your narrative is being written even as you go, even the past is also being encompassed in the vision of your life, the outline, moving toward the details and seeing how each detail going forward and each detail in the past are all part of your story. And of course, the final story, the finalizing, isn't necessarily the last day of your life. May everyone live and be well for a long time. But finalize is also in every day when this vision is informing the outline and the details, every day you're finalizing in a certain way the projects of this day, informed by the bigger vision. So think of your life as a book. We know the past, we know the past chapters, the, the coming chapters, we may, may not know most of the details, but it doesn't mean we can't have a vision for it. It doesn't mean that we are not part and partners in the unfolding drama of your own destiny. And that's what makes it so beautiful. Because the book that your life is, is not just a book a uh, static book. It's not passive. It's mobile. It's active. It's pulsating all the time. It's a work in progress. And you are part of being the author. Yes, the co-author would be God because there are factors and there are elements that you cannot predict that you can't even control. But you control your attitude toward it and you control how you're going to use whatever comes your way. And there's no doubt Trust me, if you have that vision, then whatever does come your way, even things that are unexpected and even unwanted, you'll figure out a way how that also becomes part of your story. I'll use myself as an example. When COVID struck, unexpected, and we all know the challenges, we all faced all kinds of difficulties about our people around me. Some were ill, some died, tragically. 
So it wasn't a small, it wasn't and isn't a small little matter. But because I was trained to do what I do, I went right into action. And I'm not saying this to toot my horn, I'm saying it just as an example. I used my vision and my mission to now be applied to the situation we're in. That's what it comes down to. You train your entire life, then the moment comes, you're suddenly in the circumstances you didn't even expect, but you've been trained, you have the tools. So your vision is informing the new situation you're in, which you did not expect, and you're able to navigate, just like a captain of a ship. May not know everything coming up, up ahead, whether there'll be a storm or there'll be an iceberg and so on, but he's been trained to navigate, so he learns how to navigate. So the vision is directing the navigation, the outline, the details, and every day and every moment you are doing one part of this story. So there's an element of finalizing even in a microcosmic level in the step-by-step -step process of our lives. There's so much more that can be said about this, and that's why I invite you all to contact us, contact me, if you have any further questions about this topic. I hope I did justice to this Kabbalistic model in a way that can be implemented by any one of us. And remember, it takes time to really master it, so to speak, but use paper, pen and paper, or a computer, whatever that works. Pen and paper, I like pen and paper because you're, like, you're more in touch with it. To actually lay out whatever area you are, these four steps, vision, outline, shape, and finalize. And apply that to any given project. You can do it easily with children, you can do it with yourself, you can do it with spouses, as I mentioned. And I hope I did justice to it, offering it to the public, to yourself, to use it well. And the goal of it all is obviously to make help you live a more meaningful, more productive, more actualized life in fulfilling your, your vision, your greater vision for which you were sent to this world. May you be blessed with the strength and the courage and the fortitude to navigate well. And please be in touch. MeaningfulLife.com is our website. If you've enjoyed this, please share with others. Comment, feedback, subscribe is all much appreciated because at the end of the day, this, these teachings are meant to spread like a ripple effect, helping one, helping another. Just as I was taught, my gift is to continue to teach and I hope you feel the same way, paying it forward. Everyone be well. Again, Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com. And let us stay in touch, synergize, be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.